Time now for Back Pages Tonight here on Sky Sports News, bringing you a first look at the sports stories in the morning newspapers. Joining us, top-level journalistic talent, Jason Burt, chief football correspondent for The Telegraph, and the athletics football correspondent, David Ornstein. Looking forward to talking to both of you. Let's just run through a few of the back pages. First of all, uh, this is the Mail back page depicting uh, Harry Kane and his newly unveiled statue in East London alongside his story. But Ruben Amorim will not be given money to try to turn things round in his first transfer window at Manchester United. Sun goes big on England with Jack Grealish and Jude Bellingham thanking Lee Carsley for making playing for England enjoyable again. They describe that as a dig at Gareth Southgate. Telegraph reports that Rodrigo Bentan draws seven-game ban for a racial slur aimed at his club captain, Hume Min Son, has shocked other Premier League clubs. They also depict Katie Volta and Emma Raducanu working together for GB at the Billie Jean King Cup. And the i-newspaper covers plenty of stories, including brilliant win for Scotland in Poland. Andy Robertson's fine late goal in Warsaw means they head into a playoff to try to stay in the top tier of the Nations League. And here are the two guests, uh, as described, uh, Jason Burt and David Ornstein. Very good evening to, to both of you. Let's uh, talk England. Uh, Jason, you've been banging on your soapbox for, soapbox for 10 days or so that uh, it was all wrong that Thomas Tuchel wasn't in charge for the last two games. But um, Lee Carsley signed off pretty well, hasn't he? Oh, I'm very glad you're reading my stuff. It's very, very good of you. Um, no, uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, England have got promoted back to the top tier of, of the uh, Nations League, which was obviously the, the, main, the main purpose of this, the, the, this uh, tenure. Um, but it was obviously something England had to do. I mean, if, it, if they hadn't got promoted, it would have been an embarrassment in, in the group they're in. Let's let's be frank about it. But the big bonus for Lee Carsley, and without being too churlish, is the fact that he's blooded uh, you know eight new players. You know, eight players have been given their caps. We had four players scoring against Ireland, scoring the first goal. So he has been very bold and brave in the way he's gone about things. Obviously, it backfired very very badly in that one game against Greece at home, against Wembley, when he, he tries to get all the attacking players on the pitch at the same time. And as an experiment, that simply did not work. And, and at that point, it did look like it was all turning a little bit sour for him. But he's turned it around very, very well with convincing wins against Greece and, and Ireland. And, and in terms of a, an interim period, he, he, he's done the job and, he, and he's done very, very well. I think sometimes the media relations, the way he's explained himself to the media has not been the greatest. But I do go back to the, the point you made. I do think it's very strange to me that Thomas Tuchel did not take this uh, international break. I understand the reasons why. He wanted his team in place. He wanted Anthony Barry as number two. He wants to start in January and have a clean slate starting with the World Cup campaign. But, you know, it's wasting time. It, it, there's one thing that he can never, ever, ever, ever do as England head coach. And that is complaining that he didn't have enough time with the players because he decided not to have time in this camp with the players. So therefore, it's always been the familiar complaint of international coaches that they don't get enough time to work with with their players. But Tuchel's lost that uh, lost that excuse, and it's very very clear. He's got one one task and one task only, and that's to win the World Cup. And uh, it'll be fascinating to see how he goes about that. Uh, David is nodding uh, sagely. Let me just show you the sun. Uh, take on this story. Smiles better than Gareth is the headline and the suggestion from Jack Grealish and Jude Bellingham left and right there that he's put a smile as Lee Carsley back on the players' faces and implying that Gareth Southgate didn't achieve that. I thought we all had been told for about eight years that Gareth Southgate had done exactly that, hadn't we, David? Yeah, let's not try to rewrite history here. It was a brilliant reign by Gareth Southgate and it led England to heights that most of us have never witnessed and full credit to him for that. But yeah, in the case of Grealish, it, it seems to be a bit brighter um, since Carsley had his interim spell. A, a bit of a brummy love in there, I think, with, with the comments that The Sun uh, points out. Obviously, Jude Bellingham and, and Grealish, both from that part of the world, like Carsley, has spent a lot of his time there. Um but what he has done is, as Jason alludes to, um, blooded the young players and and not just young players, but taken bold decisions by benching Harry Kane and giving Ollie Watkins a start, which which was um, vindicated really with Watkins' early goal in the Greece game. And, and that gives good options to Thomas Tuchel heading towards the 26 World Cup. And there are other strikers as well. Dominic Solanke, let's see if Ivan Tony can force his way back in. 
And across the pitch now, it, it looks like, you know, there's um, in certain areas an embarrassment of riches. In other areas, less so, but he's even tried to address that. Lewis Hall coming in and left back. Plenty of players to come back from injury, the likes of Declan Rice, Trent Alexander-Arnold. And it bodes really well. And you see his comments across the papers, uh, Lee Carsley sort of saying that, Thomas Tuchel has all the tools at his disposal now to go on and win the World Cup. And with that start date on, on the 1st of January, Tuchel has sort of um, uh, taken it upon himself to make very clear, um, as the FA have, that that is the single-minded aim. And uh, I think uh, we reflect on Carsley's tenure now um, impressively. Five wins out of six, even in the um, really poor defeats against Greece, at least he tried to do something different, which many of us and in the media and the fans were, were asking for. Okay, it, it backfired, but I think um, a hell of a lot has been learned and, and now the onus is on Thomas Tuchel to take England that one step further that they've not been for so long and, and try and win the World Cup. Um, it's a massive task. It's not going to be easy at all. There's ferocious competition out there, but I don't think they will look at many teams and, and be, you know, have more trepidation than when you see the talent that is at England's disposal. Pretty much all the papers have a, a picture of uh, Harry Kane and his statue. You can uh, love the statue or not. The Mail put it on the, the back page. Um, we might all have our views on the actual statue, but what about the performance of Harry Kane and of Ollie Watkins and the debate about uh, whether Kane is an automatic choice anymore. Clearly, the suggestion from Lee Carsley is that he's not an automatic choice, even though Kane, Jason says, I want to carry on beyond the next World Cup. Yeah, it's, it's really fascinating because obviously in Greece last week, we had Harry Kane criticising some of the players who'd, who'd pulled out. I think at that stage, he knew actually he wasn't going to start against Greece. So I think there's a little bit of annoyance there. He took it well, but I think it was a shock to him. He has been left out once before under Gareth Southgate for a competitive game, but that was one that didn't really matter too much. I think it was North Macedonia away. This one really mattered, and it was a bold decision by Lee Carsley, and a decision, I think, really that kind of shows that maybe, you know, Harry Kane can't assume anymore that when he is fit, he plays. Now, it's going to be a different manager going forward, Thomas Tuchel, and we all know that Thomas Tuchel spent £100 million bringing Harry Kane to, to Bayern Munich and is a huge fan of Harry Kane. So I, I can't see why he wouldn't carry on with Harry Kane as his main striker, at least to begin with. But what will be interesting to me is by the time we get to the World Cup in America and Mexico and Canada, the conditions are going to be very taxing. It's going to be very, very hot over there. Will we expect Harry Kane to start every game? Will we expect him to be the number one striker for England? I think at the moment, probably yes, but I think it is now in more doubt than it ever has been. We saw in the European Championships in the summer, he didn't play many 90 minutes. You know, he was often substituted by Gareth Southgate. There's always been a question about whether he presses enough and whether he was mobile enough. And all of that is, is something that's been debated by the England coaching staff for the last few years. But then he produces a pass such as the one to, to, to help you know, create the first goal against Ireland. And a piece I wrote on Saturday, no other England player could, could produce that pass. I, don't, I genuinely think he's the best pass for the ball England have as well. And I think that he's determined to carry on for as long as possible. I think he would like to play into his late 30s. He sees people like Cristiano Ronaldo doing that. And he thinks, well, why can't I do that? And we know he looks after himself and he has a determination to do so. So what I think will happen here is that he will use this as fuel and motivation to actually try even harder to make sure that he proves any doubt is wrong and he proves any questions over his suitability to be the uh, England centre forward going forward are incorrect. And I think we'll see a very determined Harry Kane for the rest of this season. Do you think it's healthy, David, generally, that no player ever thinks there's an automatic choice? Yeah, they shouldn't, but Harry Kane has earned the right. He's England's top goal scorer um, of all time. He's the captain for now, and yeah. I suspect that will continue under Tuchel. And, um, you know, the, his actions speak louder than words, to be honest, and, and his record even this season with Bayern Munich is prolific, and, and he's delivered for England since that penalty that he missed against France at the World Cup in Qatar. He scored every one, more than 20 spot kicks. And and I think it's just a good... Um, 
situation for Thomas Tuchel because th there are other strikers who can deliver and Ollie Watkins showed that brilliantly um, at the Euros to, to fire England to the final. Um, he's shown it at Premier League level with the flourishing Aston Villa team and maybe more options like Solanke and, and co emerge and, and provide further competition. But as we stand here now um, with the World Cup sort of uh, careering into sight, Harry Kane is, is the man in possession of the shirt and the position and I expect that will remain the case. But it doesn't mean that um, the impact can't be made from elsewhere, whether it be uh, Ollie Watkins or, or other contributing players, such as uh, a Bukayo Saka. We've seen Noni Madweki come through. Anthony Gordon on the other side. Can Jack Grealish force his way back in? You've got uh, Phil Foden and, and many other players. What about somebody like Mason Mount? Um, people might raise an eyebrow at that, but you know he played so well under Thomas Tuchel yeah. at Chelsea's coming back to fitness for Manchester United. So... Um, plenty of options there for, for Thomas Tuchel. And, and some international coaches, Lee Carsley was saying, have been sort of saying to him at, at conferences, UEFA conferences, like you, you have got a lot of good players there, sort of presenting it as as a difficulty, a, a, a complexity. And, and that's something that Thomas Tuchel will have to tackle. Yeah, just to press you on that, David, are you saying that Harry Kane has earned the right to be an automatic choice, that he should always start and should, should, should no go arrive every time? Knowing that he's not going to start, is that no, healthy? You no, you're right. Not not automatic. And I don't think he expects that, especially after um, uh, being put to the bench. And, and I don't think he would have been happy about that in the slightest, despite what he may have said publicly. But within the England team right now and, and what he's done to date, I think he is as near and nailed on starter still um, as anybody else. And, and, and really, he's... Um, he's earned the right to to expect to be in that team, whether it's guaranteed or not, come the World Cup, I'm not so sure. Let me move from one international captain to another and to Jason and to Andy Robertson, who, through sheer force of will, it seemed to me, got himself in a position where he had no right to be and dragged three points out of nowhere for Scotland in injury time. Well, uh, you can't tell from my accent, but I am actually Scottish. And uh, I was <laughs> jumping around not so long ago uh, when that happened. Very pleased for, for Andy Robertson and both, and also John McGinn, who's now gone ahead of Ali McCoist in terms of top goal scorers for, for Scotland. He's actually only 10 goals behind Kay Doug Leash now. So maybe John McGinn might end up as Scotland's all time top goal scorer. But Andy Robertson has been in an awful lot of question marks raised about him recently, about his form and and so on, and whether or not he actually deserves to, to carry on with the Liverpool team as the first choice. And But he's, he's been a fine captain for Scotland, and it was a great win on, on the back of the, the win against Croatia. And they've they really pulled this one out of the fire. I mean, obviously, before that, I think it was one win in, in 10. I think they'd just beaten Gibraltar or something. So it was a pretty dire record. And now they've got themselves into a playoff. And the real value of that is, is, is huge for Scotland in terms of going forward for World Cup seedings and qualifications and so on. So if they can get through that playoff, it would be fantastic to stay in the top tier of European countries, which which would be a great achievement really for Scotland. I mean, you know, England are in the B group at the moment. You know, Scotland are ahead of them, so they've done extremely well to to, to get up there in the first place. And this gives them a real fighting chance of of carry on. They've shown fantastic spirit in the last couple of games to win those two games when I think there were so many question marks over them and over Steve Clark and whether or not he'd he'd, he'd run his race. I covered a few of their games at the Euros. Now I wasn't sure or not a change was needed after those games because it felt like it was running out of ideas then, but they've, they've done fantastically well to turn it around and, and I'm very pleased in particular for Andy Robertson. Jason, I'll leave our viewers to have your voice ringing in their ears and to picture you in a kilt marching through the heather and we'll be back with you uh, and with David Ornstein very shortly looking at more of the back pages, including this in the Telegraph. Rodrigo Bentancourt handed a seven-match ban shocked some of Tottenham's rivals, according to Jason's paper. Bring you more on that next. You're watching Back Pages tonight in the company of Jason Burt, Chief Football Correspondent for The Telegraph and the Athletics Football Correspondent David Ornstein. And I'm going to start, Jason, with your paper, so I will start with you there. Headline, The Telegraph, Ben Tancur ban shocks rivals. He's got seven matches and a £100,000 fine for... Uh, a racist remark that he made about Hyun Min Son. What do you make of the size of the ban? Your paper's headlines suggest that some other clubs are surprised at the ban. Yeah, I think it's a very complex case and actually it's a very complex issue and, that, and, the, and the rules themselves are, are quite complex. But 
actually, this is this is pretty much in line with the, the ban that you'd expect for, for what he's been found guilty of. However, um, what clubs are questioning is is the consistency of, of some of the, the punishments that have been handed out. And obviously, Southern Games feels like a very long ban, especially for a player who's shown contrition, who has apologised um, and, has, and, and has obviously uh, had Hung Min Son himself um, come out in, def- in his defence um, and just obviously said it was a, a poor a poor joke. H- however, you know, it, it is it is a, a clear breach of the rules and, uh, and the FA has been able to charge him and, and, and the punishment's been handed down. I think there is a feeling also that, that it could be a a, a chance or an attempt by the FA to, to set an example because actually um, the abuse of, of, of people from Southeast Asia has, has risen hugely in terms of um, uh, cases being reported, especially in football in, in the last couple of years. And I think the FA is acutely aware of, of that. A lot of that abuse actually has been aimed at Son from online trolls and so on and so forth. So I think they want to try and set an example to a degree, but in saying that it's not as if they've gone out of their way within the rules to punish Benton Court. It does feel quite severe. And there are lots of examples where people are saying, well, you know, for, for example, Bernardo Silva only got a, a, a one game ban for, for a post about um, a joke he made about uh, his teammate, Benjamin Mendy. And that does seem a, a, a seven games compared to, to one does feel very different. But I haven't read all the written reasons yet, but I've, I've read through the stories and the, the, the panel is very, very clear that the breach is, 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 is a direct one. And although he has um, shown contrition, he didn't admit the charge. And therefore, you know, I'm not surprised he's been given such a lengthy ban. I've read some of the written reasons and it's, it's made clear, David, that the ban was bigger than it might have been because it was in a television interview. If it had been in a social media post, it might have been less, which I find slightly surprising in the modern age. Yeah, it seems, uh, as per the rules, the... Um, uh, written communication or on, on a personal device would be uh, fewer than six games, whereas if it's an interview such as this, it is a six-game minimum. Uh, so it's quite um, complex in terms of the actual application, also the jurisdiction. So he was on international duty, which a number of people have pointed to in the case of sort of Enzo Fernandez um, and a couple of others. Uh, but actually, he had just finished international duty <laughs> because of... Um, that discrepancy there, he comes under the FA's jurisdiction. Um, and so the FA have taken this punishment. Uh, other people have pointed out that for discrimination, you tend to see the FA hand out sort of 10, 12 game bans. And so this is more lenient than that. It's just above the minimum entry level at six. Obviously, Tottenham are disappointed. And you can kind of understand that when you see Son Heung Min's reaction personally to somebody who's clearly a a close friend of his. But the panel have ruled that the fact that Ben Tancor apologised so quickly shows that he recognised it was an offensive remark and and his wrongdoing, even though he subsequently um, challenged the the uh, charge. And, and there still is a right to appeal against it. So let's see h- how it finishes. But I think all of us would agree that there kind of needs to be examples made across society, whether it fair on on Ben Tancor and Tottenham in this case and and he'll miss a crucial run of fixtures in the in the Premier League and also the League Cup uh, though he is eligible to play in Europe um but just discrimination of all sorts um and certainly of this nature and, and casual language that was referred to initially by Ben Tancor as a joke um uh, later sarcasm uh, it just needs to be cut out i don't know why people um use these casual sort of stereotypes and uh find it amusing and and unfortunately for him and Tottenham in this case, if that is an example that's used and, and it can send a message out to people in all walks of life, including in football, to stop using such sort of casual um, yeah. and offensive language, then then that is a good thing. I think we'd, I think we'd all agree that. But consistency is, is what we need, isn't it? Jason, did you want to make a quick point on that? I want to get on to Rue and Amory in a second, but you looked like you might be bursting to add a comment. No, no, no. I was just agreeing with David, really, to be well, honest with you. Excellent I mean, I think thing. <laughs> You just answered your question far better than I did. That's, that's, that's all. <laughs> um, OK, let's move on to uh, Ruben Amorim then, who is uh, increasingly um, getting his feet under the table uh, at uh, Old Trafford. Um, David, do you want to go first on this? Uh, that headline, no war chest for Amorim. That is what most bosses tell most new managers, especially going into 
uh, to January. Does he need a war chest urgently in January? I don't think so. Uh, it's never been a massive window for Manchester United or, or many Premier League clubs to spend. They normally focus on the summer. Manchester United have signed over the last few years on average about five players per summer and I suspect they'll invest again when it comes to that window. But right now, Manchester United are... Uh, uh, cutting it fine on financial fair play, profitability and sustainability. So the money just isn't really there. They've made cut, you know, cutbacks across the board, including um, an ambassadorial role for Sir Alex Ferguson. They're even looking at um, uh, the allocation of finances that they give to the Disabled Supporters Association. Um, so when it comes to transfer spending, uh, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, Manchester United invested heavily. There are a lot of good players there who they can get improved performances out of. And Ruben Amorin is renowned for uh, improving players. And so he'll try and work with those at his disposal. Maybe they can do a little bit in the market. Maybe some players will have to leave, as I think Jeremy Cross points out. Um, maybe Anthony could be on his way out of the club and that could free up some some finances. But I, I think it will be a low-key January at Old Trafford. And Ruben Amorin, uh, I think there's a very good chance he will show through his coaching what he's capable of. And then they'll build in time using the markets too. If you were a Manchester United fan, Jason, and I'm, I'm sure you're not going to tell me you're a United fan as well as a Scott, um, would, would you be uh, laughing all the way to, towards Christmas? You, are you super optimistic in that position? Do you know, I, I was thinking about this a lot, and I'm, I'm going to go up to Manchester for his first press conference. I, I was... This might, I miss, it might come to regret saying this, by the way. <laughs> I was there when Jose did his first press conference at Chelsea. There is an air around Amarim of a modern Mourinho, not necessarily that edgy in the way that Mourinho was, but that air of confidence and ability around mm. him that I think he can carry a club like Manchester United. And they've been looking for somebody fresh like this for, for a number of years. And obviously they had Jose for a while, but it was why he was on a downward curve. With Amarim, they've got someone on the up. And I think they thought they had that with Ten Hag, but he never quite had the personality to carry a club like Manchester United. I think Amarim is the real deal. I think he will make a very big difference at Manchester United, will be transformative. Whether he can get them to where they want to be this season, I think there could be a bit of consolidation, but I think they, they, they are definitely on the right track with this, this manager. I could regret that, but I, I feel this is the one. This is the best appointment they've made since, uh, obviously, Sir Alex Ferguson left. Let me give you 20 seconds each. This is very unfair, I know. To just, just to, what's mm -hmm. the first thing, the most important thing in his inbox, David? Uh, he needs to improve the culture, the spirit, the atmosphere. They've very little time to train, very little contact with the players. Match after match, midweek and weekend, he needs to work on the basics, get the spirit and the, the confidence up, uh, which has been low of late. Jason? I think it's the combinations up front, actually, I'm fascinated by. If he sticks with that 3-4-3 three, three formation, how he's going to make that work, where Bruno Fernandes fits in, where Marcus Rashford, Hoyland, these players fit in. I think that's where I'm really fascinated by. And Rashford, in particular, really needs to be re-energised and really needs a coach to get behind him and get the best out of him because he should be absolutely at his peak at the moment. And unfortunately, he's quite not, not there. And even more unfair, five seconds each, where are they going to finish at the end of the season? David? Just outside the top four. Jason? I would agree with that. I'd say fifth or sixth. Thank you both very much indeed. You can get a job doing this. Thanks for watching, dear Jason Burt, David Ornstein, two of our favourite guests on Backpage tonight. We'll be back again uh, tomorrow night. The show also has a podcast. Just download Backpages on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts.